Buddy, well, it stems from a, a question from someone who asked, what are you going to do uh, for the rest of your life? And I said, well, I'd like to go around Australia, but I'd like to do it in a different way and for a purpose. Uh, Jacob was promoting his wheelchair trek around Australia. He was almost ready for takeoff and he still needed some people to go with him. A friend of mine immediately wanted to go and said, give me a ride, give me a ride, I'm going to Jacob's house for an interview, I want to go. Jacob thought that I was there for an interview as well and he started asking me all these questions. I didn't resist, I just answered these questions and at the end he said, well, do you want to go? And I said yes and it, it wasn't something I thought about, it just came from nowhere. I just said yes and he said, well, can you be ready in three weeks? And I said yes. It seemed really funny of no one, though. Yeah. I didn't think going to the office. He actually contacted his mother and uh, myself, and uh, as I recall, and uh, informed us that he was preparing for this track around Australia, and uh, I think he sent some photos down, or oh, sent a magazine down which showed him out on the roads near Byron Bay there, doing some uh, some trials. And of course, uh, seeing the photo and seeing this great line of traffic, and you know, <laughs> thought to ourselves, well, he's really taking something on. We were driving down, actually, the first day we left Mullumbimby. We did a short trek to Byron Bay and then we drove down to Sydney, which was where we were going to commence the trek from. And, Jacob was the passenger, I was driving, um, and we were just talking and talking, and I, and I knew that I, that I really liked the guy. Um, we got on fantastically, and it was, it was very strong from that first night. To my knowledge, there wasn't a great deal of preparation. I think it was about $100 was, the, was their actual financial backing. They really had uh, very little to, you know, to fall back on, but they were determined. that having a disability is a burden to the community. I believe that being classified as, as disabled doesn't mean that you haven't got ability. My outlook has changed um, to people with disabilities a lot since I first began. Uh, when I first met Jacob I was quite hesitant, I didn't know how to approach him, he looked different. I sort of bit my fingernails and thought, what am I supposed to say? The trick is trying to change people's attitudes um, in, in that way, that um, people with disabilities have still have so many abilities and can get out and achieve things in their lives. <laughs> the Nissan support vehicle was being uh, rust proofed in the interior so they borrowed a, a vehicle to carry the wheelchair and it had a small tray. Unfortunately someone had not locked the tray properly. 
they were driving along and a motorist was frantically trying to contact them so they pulled up and they were informed that they'd lost their load. That certainly cast a, uh, a pall of gloom on everybody, you know. But before very long they had, they had a, uh, an actual chair to replace the, the original one. Jacob's outlook towards life is very positive. It's, um, it's infectious, actually. It rubs off on people. I see the uh, people that he talks to get motivated and inspired by what he's doing and, and inspires them to get up and do what they want to achieve in their own lives, myself included. I had, I had teenage dreams of, and things like that of who I was going to be with and it, and it wasn't someone who had cerebral palsy but it, it doesn't take me by surprise really because Jacob still has those qualities. Jacob still is the, is the person that I love and I, and I often even don't see his disability either. Down the cement. It's easier coming down the cement. Mm. And then you back up here. Mm. Hello. This is Mikey. Hello. Mikey. You think Mikey's a funny name? We used to joke about, we used to joke on the trek that um, Jacob was the guru. We used to say, you know, go and ask the guru, go and see the guru. And it became a joke in the end, but really, I think. Um, to most of us, he was a guru in one way or another. This is so fantastic! <laughs> Woo! Okay, so another 25k up the track. Is that what we're doing? Apparently. That, do you? Yeah. It's another, what, three hours? Yeah, wow. Yeah, we were all sort of pretty buoyed along by the whole thing and believed that we were um, part of a fairly special experience. And we were reminded, you know, from time to time about why we were doing it and what it was all for, because at times, you know, when you're a little tired of the same old routines, you'd just want to go and grab the car and do some sightseeing somewhere and that didn't always go down very well and probably wasn't always appropriate. people would say, why well, go across the Nullarbor at that pace? You know, most people want to do it as quickly as possible and close their eyes. But um, I don't know, there was something in it, going so slowly and really having time to digest it all and think about life, you know, beyond getting up and switching on the television. And so I really enjoyed it. We had um, really good CB contact with all the truckies and every so often we'd be saying, you know, this is the trek, we're at such and such a location, you know, any trucks, you know, in front behind, can you let people know that we're on the road and we had quite good conversations. Merry Christmas to you. All right, well done. Yeah, they were really good, most of them. We didn't have any trouble. They just went straight past and carried on, two to the horn. <laughs>
like Jacob and Julia would often say, um, you're not coming on, on this thing as a job because it's not a job. It's not work and it's not rest. It's not like, you know, divided up into work, rest and play. It's a lifestyle. That's what it is. You know, either you're sort of part of it or you're not because it goes 24 hours a day. You don't clock off. I think the main problem was at that particular time, as I recall, they had gone into Western Australia and there had been a change of government and the situation in Western Australia was that uh, a charity from another state, from interstate, had to have an established office. Hello there and thanks for joining us. With me in the studio today is Jacob Baldwin, who is on a wheelchair trek around Australia. Um, we found out that we weren't able to register because of some legal problems, um, you know, legalities in the law. And we couldn't collect money. And to that point, we survived on donations from the public. During our time in Perth, while we were trying to get a licence to fundraise, a lot of the crew thought that this was the end of the ability track. We couldn't fundraise in Western Australia, um, therefore that was the end. It had a, an incredibly tiring, draining effect because of all the uncertainty of whether we would ever be able to get the licence to fundraise. Ability track. Track. T-R-E-K. One giant leap. One giant shift for one guy. One last push for license. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. So, what's Julia's thoughts on her fiance about to commit suicide? <laughs> oh, good on him. Let's be positive. <laughs> yeah, good on him. And be positive. <laughs> good on you, Jack. had a, a charity already there that they felt their objectives were similar. Um, we did try to get around this incident by saying, well this is, you know, ours is a historic event, nobody has travelled around Australia in an electric wheelchair. However, they dug their toes in and said, no, we will not allow you to fundraise in Western Australia. Well, the main problem was that it took so long getting the required arrangement with the particular government in Western Australia, uh, it meant that they were virtually stranded in Perth. Mr. didn't want to do anything rash. So, although she was sympathetic, she was understanding, she felt she couldn't do anything. They weren't getting the, the assistance from the government, it wasn't a quick decision, and so they, they could see that they had to make a decision. It was an incredibly low in time of great uncertainty whether we would actually make it or whether the trek would just terminate at that point.
Hold meetings, we contacted sponsors and we did all sorts of think tanks and all just all sorts of ways to try and, you know, overcome the birds. John left the trek while Jacob and I were in Sydney because he felt that it it would not continue. It was a long period of waiting time. It was pretty unrealistic to think that somebody could wait for nine months for something to start again. So John liked Perth and, and so he left at that point. Of course, at that stage, the major problem was, was finding a suitable bus. As it turned out, uh, once they got the bus, uh, they got two excellent team members, uh, Jacob Greck and his wife, who came to Sydney and, ja and Jacob virtually uh, rebuilt this old school bus. It seems to me that if we had vehicle builders and, and carpenters actually doing the work that, I don't know, it would lose, it'd lose some of that sort of, um, that magic about going beyond our abilities. Very historic map in time. I can remember the, the last day in Sydney we were packing up all our stuff in the MMI office, which we'd been using during that period, and it was incredible. There was so much stuff everywhere, there was so much paperwork involved, and we were packing it all up, and we were going. Goodbye! <laughs> we left Sydney in January 1994, which was two years after we first set out. It was a gorgeous sunny day, and we were going no matter what and it was just an incredible sense of achievement to get on the road again. reason and I don't think it was really made clear to everybody that the trek had to leave on April the 29th. It was just disorganised. You know if you're going to leave as a team you've got to be properly prepared as a team. talk to you about his, uh, his trek around uh, Australia in, uh, in his wheelchair. So I'll pass you over to Mr. Baldwin. Good morning, Kim. Call him now. Hello. Okay, Carly, you were first. If you'd like to ask your question, Carly. How do you travel around Australia in a wheelchair? How do I travel around Australia in a wheelchair? I travel on the road, on the highway one, and that's in the traffic. I also have a escort car behind me, so it warns the other cars that are speeding past in the on the head. 
slow down, and some slow down, but others don't. Now, don't you go wasting my videotape, young Dan, fiddling about. This is the bus and the thing that's actually kept me pretty busy over the past couple of months. I did actually. I did see the stones that Sarah got. They're over here, aren't they? Starting off, we've just got the front and the driver's seat and whatnot. Got a flying doctor radio, a mobile phone, um, just cabinets for keeping video equipment and whatnot. The shelves are pretty good. We keep all our clothes up in the shelves. As you come through, you can see we've got TV and video, filing cabinet for all information. It's one of the wheelchairs. Um, a hoist to lift Jacob in, and all your general things like your cooker and your fridge and delir and the sink and whatnot. <laughs> well, we're travelling along, uh, probably at about top speed at the moment, uh, 40 kilometres an hour. exactly what had happened to the bus, the, you know, what had happened? The engine had died. And? I don't know all the technical detail, but it wasn't going to go anywhere. No, what does this mean? This is today. Today is the day that we've decided we're going to have to leave Did the track. Did you cut this? Well, these were out of our engine and it had been rebuilt and they got a bit bent. Someone didn't quite do up the bits that they were supposed to and then the bottom bit fell off and this bit got jammed and it twisted everything, destroyed it all. So please continue. The bus has died. The bus died? This is where the old engine used to live that went off like a hand grenade. Yeah, yeah, it's a 345 International V8. Yeah, ours blew up. Where would we have to go to get one of them? Victoria. Okay. No Is this a disaster? I might have hiccup, but it could be seen as a disaster, but it will cease to be a disaster the moment we get it fixed. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. We just had some great news. Uh, it seems that Frank um, and Dampier has decided to pay for the engine. So we've got an engine. Free. We've got an engine and uh, it's not coming out of the charity funds. Okay, we got the grog. Hey. Yeah. Can you hear the song of the whistle as my memory rolls on its way? Look up, my train in the morning, but I retire today. I feel the throb of the open, old swing beat of it. Today is the last of my journeys in the iron or country around. Oh, I just drove along the road coming north from Perth, and here's a woman standing beside the road. And I pulled up beside her and I said, "Hey, Maluxin, you want to lift north, yeah?" And that was actually how I met them. And their bus had blown up, and the motor had blown up, and. And I asked them if they could get another motor, and they said, yeah, well, we've got one, but it's paying for it. So I rang them up later, and I said, well, I'll send you over the money to pay for the motor as long as you can fit it in. So I actually went up there while they're fitting it in anyway to see how they got on with it, you know. I'll eat the old lady, the lady, the old lady. This thing was just about around the clock to start off and then until we found that everything else had shit itself like your water pump, your fuel pump, your carby, what else did we, oh and your starter motor. After that we just like gave it in and 
done it as quick as we could. And three and a half weeks later, finally mobile. Oh, I love you too, Peter! <laughs> the um, bus is finally finished and it'll be running correctly for the first time ever. Well, I'm glad to see it drive out that gate. I'm just happy to see it. I'll be throwing a can of beer at you as soon as I see you go out that gate. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Let's hear it. Here we go, we're just about to start this bus. Put your cigarette out. No. On three, on two, on one, start it. So Sarah, I'd like you to tell me please, uh, what has brought us to today? Today has been a, a big day here. Um, it, it would seem that we've run out of time on our visa. We're going to have to leave. Um, Diane is leaving and Daniel has decided to leave. How do you feel about that? Good love! <laughs> <laughs> Too bad if you don't. <laughs> what we have here is bedtime torture treatment by Glenn Gates oh. to Jacob Baldwin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> torture treatment, torture treatments. Evening David. Hi Glenn, how are you going? 9th of September 94. Yes, that's correct. It's been an epic day today. Actually it started out pretty tough. I was a bit worried, it's going to be a hot day. Oh, my frail little body wasn't up to it. And you cope really well? Yeah, I, I, I think I made it through. But <laughs> thanks to my 2000 AD comment. <laughs> and a few, um, a few lollies. <laughs> Collies oh, favour you. <laughs> they hit the spot. Oh, they certainly did. Yep. How was Jacob today? How, how um, did he stand up to the road? How did you well, stand up to him on the road? He's a seasoned professional. We, <laughs> we all know that. So a little fledgling like me against the grand master of, uh, <laughs> of travelling on the road. I, I, I felt humbled in his presence and in fact the, the later on the day um, we got, um, the more interesting our conversations got and after a while I actually liked it. And by the end of the day I wanted to do more. <laughs> I'm just sorry that tomorrow hasn't come. <laughs> okay, last night being the 4th of November, I was casually pushing Mr B in his wheelchair this way. <laughs> just barely towers all over him and didn't notice this step here. <laughs> as much as I'm laughing now, it was a sad effect because as I went over the curve, the dump truck effect came into it both. And unfortunately, Mr. B, this big cartwheel on the ground. I mean, we do feel sorry for the poor man because as you can see over here, Mr. B isn't in a shaking mood. No longer shaking Stevens, it's Mr. B, the man who's been wrapped up, the mummy, the mummy from the deep south. <laughs> so, we have a bit of a problem now. The problem is that I'm going to have to uh, steer my wheelchair with one sprained thumb. You have a try, Mr. B, see how you go. Yeah. Fingers on, action stations. Kickstart.
Halfway and still going. Hey, it's Rolf Harris. Hey, that's what I said. Rolf Harris in your heart out. I hope that this will bring some, some inspiration, some motivation, some idea that if you have a, a class 5 disability, no matter how severe it is, there is a lot of things that can be done. With, with a condition like mine, you do get a sense of being closed in, being trapped, whereas on the road you're free. My first impression, one of amazement. I expect to get quite a, a learning experience from it. I've never met anybody with so much determination and that's the main reason I'm here because of his determination, his positive thinking you know, he sees nothing as being negative and I find that quite a phenomenon <laughs> Keep it going up that hill, boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, road train. <laughs> okay. I was sitting on the side of the highway, not knowing anything, just hitchhiking, and all of a sudden up comes John, and he asks me, Hey, how would you like to come along on a wheelchair track around Australia? It'd be no worries. <laughs> what? <laughs> At first I was a little apprehensive and uncomfortable being he's disabled and I mean society ingrains this you know, ingrains being uncomfortable around disabled people, but once I got to know him, I realized, you know, he's completely normal mentally and I, I felt like I could really I could really uh I don't know, get in touch with him because he's got a good sense of humor and he's really, really smart and I'm just absolutely impressed and I feel that I'm gaining a personal positive attitude for myself and I think I can just grow from that. some mechanical problems with the bus brakes in Mount Isa. It was an unfortunate time. There was nobody in Mount Isa at that stage who could fix the brakes or even check them.
The crew weren't getting on with each other. There was a time delay getting stuck in Mount Isa and people yeah. had made a commitment Try only for three months. Could they help you complete your project? And also, you know, try and be a friend with you, but the last few weeks it's been like hell. I found it like, you know, we're sort of, it's well, been I sort of two you sections, of, you know, everyone's sort of broken up. And John, you came, we know how you excuse felt me, I'm talking to Jake. I'm talking to Jake. Thank you, all right? You, you've said how you I'm felt. I'm talking though. to Jake, please. Yeah, if you had just had come up and said, how do you feel? Are we meant to be part of a crew or what? Also, a lot of the crew didn't get on. Um, nobody trusted each other anymore. There was a lot of dishonesty happening, a lot of different agendas. That means that you are yeah. quite prepared no, to go back three ways of bloody ball tracks. No, no, that's not what James John was missing the ocean. He didn't like being inland. He, he found it very difficult being away from the ocean and really wanted to go to Cairns. Bullshit, Julia. I could drive all the way to Cairns without even using the brakes, Julia. I bet you couldn't even get the road here without using the brakes. John, that's a really personal thing. I'm not even... So John felt very strongly that the bus should be driven to Cairns to get the back brakes checked. But I'm telling you how, with a difference, why well, I'm prepared to drive the thing for repairs. Okay, I, I I'm doing the joke, actually. I'm responsible okay, well, for this whole project. You said that three or no, four times, Jake. No, 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 I've heard you loud and deeply. No, 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 no matter what yep. Julia says, no matter what, what you say, yep. if it sounds unsafe, it's not going. Okay. Well then, what's going to happen? That's what I want to know. It's all all I want is an answer, Jake. Either you want me to do it or you yeah, don't. I want to it's, do it. Okay, it's as easy as that with me. I'm prepared to take the risk, but 40 k's an hour. In the end, John left the trek and didn't drive the bus back to Mount Isa as originally agreed. So I flew to Cairns to get the bus the work that they actually did on the bus was on the steering. Uh, they said there had been a problem there, so that was what was fixed. But the brakes had been fine all along. Santa, I've been a good boy this year. Have you been a good boy? Yes, yes, yes. Well, well. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh.
don't know what's going to happen and I don't know how it's going to be, which you can't find out until you get there. So I don't really have any expectations about that. I just expect that it's going to be really interesting and really different and really hard a lot of the time, but mostly a really good experience. basically been keep all the machinery rolling. I like Matilda. <laughs> She's a pleasure to drive. And uh, when she came to me, she was, was just running nicely. The first couple of weeks is, is that, or the first week at least, is that gradual process of, of learning what it's all about and what you've taken on and that kind of stuff. So it's more a lot of questions and so it is, it's slow because you're questioning a lot and they're questioning you. What are you going to have for tea? We're having a mushroom pastry thing. It's good, good iron intake. Being a member of the team and doing your duties as well as a cameraman, uh, it's not an easy job, I'll tell you. Because it's supposed to share the caring of Jacob as well as doing our individual duties as well. It's something you can compare it to any other kind of job when you get as a cameraman. You know. Well, Farrah doesn't know <laughs> put the camera on and go, wee wee wee! There was a fair bit of nervousness when I first started caring for Jake, um, just in the in the picking him up and moving him around, thinking, well, what's going to happen if I drop him, or, or um, what's going to happen if he has a spasm and falls? And uh, I guess it wasn't until he actually did fall one day that um, that I got over that. <laughs> <laughs> We all have needs, and uh, our needs have got to be met. And I think if you can give somebody a hand to do something, that they uh, that they might mightn't be able to necessarily do for themselves, I think that's a that's a good thing for somebody to do. achieve from the endeavour is do two things. One, heal my own heart. And the second two, to achieve a little more peace and a little more balance than I had the day before I started the trek. We're starting today at 7 o'clock, which is an ungodly hour. I think attitudes are slowly changing. And I think... Uh, I think that's one of the, the really positive aspects of the trek is the the amount of people that that we've gone to, uh, whether it be truck drivers or school kids or service clubs. The message is getting out there, and uh, I think I think it'll happen. I think the change change will come. Hey, mate. Uh -huh. Welcome home. Hi. How are you? No, we haven't oh, seen you. Hello, Olivia. Nice to meet you too. 
Nice friend. to meet you too. Oh, it's Mara. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'm Olivia. Olivia, how did it, Kevin? To you, you're brave, you're brave, you're brave. Huh? And? Farah, that's Farah. How did it, Farah? Pleased to meet you. Oh, I feel magnificent. I haven't seen him for such a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, how happy to see all of you. Because uh, I heard that such a wonderful crew. You've been all the time with Jacob? Yeah. So Jacob, you're home. Ooh. Yeah, I think that Jacob and Julia have been very fortunate to come across in the process of the trek. Some very I know they've had some people that obviously didn't sort of fit in, but by and large most of the crew members were really solid citizens. In your brain now, Jacob? Um, to get over the Harrow Bridge. Alright, let's rock! every other crew member left, the trek would still go on. But if Julia left, I think it wouldn't necessarily. I mean, Jacob would make it still go on, but not in the same kind of vein, perhaps, as well as it has because of Julia. Jacob Baldwin, the man at the front of the parade, been travelling around Australia in his electric wheelchair at eight kilometres an hour. How do you feel, Pete? Stoked. Absolutely stoked. In tears. Boys, are you on the race? I'm going to lock you up. Okay, no right. problem. Right, I can't knock around. Yep. Yep, sure. The officer in charge just mentioned that if uh, I was to step back on the road again during the process, I'd be locked up, my film would be confiscated and used in evidence against me, um, and that he thought I was taking the whole thing as a bit of a joke. I tried to explain that it's actually a job. Um, at that point he decided to um, read the riot act, so I shut up. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't want to talk. I guess I believed in the abilities of people with classified disabilities, I mean people with conditions who are who are seen as disabled but disability is not a um, not a not the end of life it's, uh, it's really a matter of switching your attitude over to 
what you can do rather than what you can't do. So, if the flower girls would like to come, I'll give a big round of applause for Jacob and Julia as they come to get married.